All right, cool. Here we are. We're going to talk a little bit about small town and big stereotypes in South Park. Man, some people are ripping down the Lorraine Highway right now. It's been so quiet out here uh, with everybody staying at home. I've been loving it, but people are ripping around on, on this day. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about the town of South Park and we'll talk about stereotyping. We'll begin to talk about stereotyping in South Park because uh, it plays a major role in, in the show itself. Um, not only does the show, uh, you know, highlight stereotypes and the ridiculousness of them, it also in many ways perpetuates stereotypes. Again, this is often going to depend on you, on the consumer and your level of maturity, how you read into um, text. Uh, themselves and how you make sense out of them. So South Park is kind of, you know, in this gray area of both, you know, deconstructing and destroying stereotypes, but also reinforcing them depending on uh, the consumer. So a little bit about uh, our shitty little city. Um, South Park itself, the town, is actually based on a place um, in Colorado called Fair Play. Um, uh, Trey Parker grew up, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 miles away from this, uh, this place. And it's basically, you know, a population of 600 people. It's a small, like, old Western style town, like, still. Like, um, not much going on there, but it's a major, um, major, major site for UFO sightings in the United States. Hence the, um, you know, common use of aliens uh, in episodes of, of South Park itself. Okay. Um, I think when you look at South Park itself, of the people in South Park, um, the politicians in South Park, the, the children and their perspectives, um, you really see how the show and how the, the town um, is really both a parody and also a satire on the ignorance of, of small town America. Um, and specifically white small town America, really kind of deconstructing, um, you know, the protection, like, you know, um, in the sense of protecting, like, the virtues of the small town or protecting the identity or the history of the, of the small town um, from outsiders um, and outside perspectives. Um, you know, but South Park in itself then really becomes a parody of whiteness. You really have to see it as this, this sort of, you know, um, extreme sort of whiteness, white privilege, um, maybe even white supremacy in, in some ways, um, and also the ignorance of white people in so many ways, the sort of naivety of, 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 of many, many white people out there um, who grew up in a small town uh, filled with mostly other white people. Um, me, you know, that's where I grew up. Um, you know, and the sense of, like, making fun of that is super important. That sort of how you incubate certain perspectives and therefore stereotypes, um, you know, in a place like that. So South Park really kind of tries to deconstruct um, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of world. Um, I think it's pretty interesting, the use of Main Street in South Park, um, something that you don't really see in a lot of places or a lot of cities or towns anymore. This idea, you know, where you have the nickel and dime store, the mom and pops hardware store, you know, uh, the little market, um, you know, stuff like that, like it, uh, like you see in the Midwest in some towns um, that they're trying to save in a lot of those places. Um, so you have like this nostalgic downtown and you have Main Street a little bit more bustling. Um, and then you have like the retail spaces, the malls, you know, um, Whole Foods eventually, you know, come in these larger uh, retail spaces that kind of meet this sort of Main Street and nostalgic downtown space. Um, one of the main features of the town of South Park is the town square. This is where a lot of citizens, the, the people of South Park, often come to rabble, 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 you know, to yell and have, have meetings and where, you know, a lot of events take place, where screenings of films take place, where, um, you know, uh, performances uh, happen, uh, etc. Uh, so I think, you know, the town square also plays a vital role of where people come together in the small town of, of South Park. And oftentimes they're gathering there for moments of carnivalesque 
think about Mr. Slave versus Paris Hilton and the horror off. <sighs> okay, um, I think the important part, and this comes from the chapter, is that these Main Street shops that you see, like Tom's Rhinoplasty, um, and, you know, Tweaks Coffee, and these other places, um, are there, they're facades in a way, and they're there to sort of gesture to stereotypes. So, what I'll, I'll quote from, from um, Blame Canada is it gestures the one dimensionality of town life and the narrowness of small town mentality by creating these shops in this downtown space. So we have, you know, Tom's Rhinoplasty, the South Park Mall, the straight up um, downtown uh, area. It's to gesture sort of stereotypes in these small, mostly white, mostly rural. Um, towns in, in America and that perspective, that ideology, that sort of, um, you know, in that, that nativism uh, of those places um, in terms of keeping out outsiders, outside perspectives, people who are not like those in the town of South Park. You have all sorts of other types of buildings in the small town uh, USA. You have a Catholic church, you have a big um, synagogue, okay? You have other buildings like uh, the police department, hospital, library, obviously the school uh, is a major place here. Uh, we have, of course, a bijou, a, a theater uh, where the boys often go. And while this may appear, as the author says, as white noise, these buildings have significance. They have meaning, um, and they're inscribed with meaning. Why is the synagogue, you know, um, large, you know, um, and the Catholic Church you know, small, right? It has a lot to do with, you know, how the, the boys comment on money um, in, in episodes as related to certain religions, okay? Um, but these, these buildings become uh, indicative of an iconic displays of those who inhabit them. And I think that's a, you know, and how the South Park episodes and how the, the writers, how they, um, you know, sort of caricaturize the inhabitants of these of these spaces. So there's meaning in those spaces. They're not just there. Um, I think the important thing when you look at the houses, when we get into neighborhoods, they're the no, denotations of class. They're class-based. So they, they show class difference, class stratification. Um, and I think like part of what the book gets into is how these, these houses, um, most of which are middle class sort of you know, two-story split-level homes um, are the embodiment of the American dream, the white picket fence, you know, two cars in the driveway, you know, the nice yard, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and this, this hope of having private property and owning property is like being the ultimate part of that dream. And they, they kind of deconstruct that. It's very subtle, um, but it's there in how they represent it. Okay, and you see this with buildings, other homes like Kenny's, Home, right? They're the only poor people in town who live on the other side of the tracks. Again, the other side of the tracks being another denotation of class stratification in, it, in and of itself. Um, but like when we get into the, the um, PC and gentrification season arc, you know, obviously they build uh, uh, um, soda sopa all around uh, Kenny's shitty house, right? They gentrify the, the, that neighborhood. It's the shitty neighborhood in South Park. Um, the poor neighborhood in South Park. And then you have like Token's neighborhood. So there's an episode called Here Comes the Neighborhood. Um, you know, Token's rich, like very wealthy and lives in a big, uh, a big home. And so in Here Comes the Neighborhood, it's a play on race, um, but it's all these wealthy African Americans come, come to South Park and they all build big houses and move into big houses in Token's neighborhood. We'll, we'll probably get into that episode um, a little bit. But this comes from Blame Canada. South Park is not a town, it's a state of mind. And I think that's just such a really telling um, quote. You know, it's, it's the state of mind, not necessarily the town itself that's often being like just deconstructed in, in the episode. So they're tearing apart this sort of small town America mentality, um, you know, as represented and mimicked and parodied and satirized um, by the people of South Park. Um, you know, we see different elements when we get into the gentrification and PC arc 
um, you know, Soda Sopa, um, you know, the gentrified part of town around Kenny's house, and then the shitty pot of town, uh, which is the historic shitty pot of town where you have shitty walk and Skeeter's Wine and Bar, and obviously the new Whole Foods comes in into that, into that neighborhood, which is a major element of where Whole Foods go to, like, shitty pot of town. Um, South Park, though, then, and this is in so many episodes, so, so many episodes, has to deal with the threat of outsiders. There's always an outside threat to South Park. Always. This is just incredibly important um, to understanding episodes, that there's always some form of an outside threat. Okay? And these threats often disturb the balance in the town, this equilibrium. And this could be anything, right, that disturbs this equilibrium. We could think of aliens, hippies come into town, child molesters, Mormons, right, uh, uh, Scientologists, uh, celebrities often, uh, rich people, um, richers, uh, goobacks, um, you know, really just always, you know, politicians, uh, just so many um, outside threats to the town that come in and that episodes are based upon. Um, and we'll watch an episode called Child Abduction uh, is Not Funny, which really deals with this, which deals with building a wall, um, you know, uh, to, to, to keep out outsiders and to keep out outside uh, perspectives in a way, which is what it means. But I, you know, I think I have to always ask, like, what is a stereotype? Now, it's nice when I have you in class and I can see how you define it and how you give meaning to the word stereotype and how you've grown up to like sort of un understand it. Um, and I think there's just some very simple ways to think about it, right? Um, it's just simply beliefs about a group of people and based upon their membership to a group. It's really like the base way that you can think of it. Oh, you're a Scientologist. You're, you're like this. Oh you, you know, drive a Toyota truck, you must be like this, you know, oh, you're Asian, you must be like this, oh, you're Catholic, you must be like this, right? Um, these are beliefs, and again, these things can be positive or negative, negative. and this, um, you know, journalist, pretty, pretty important thinker, uh, Walter Lippmann said, pictures in our heads, so we hear a group's name or hear about a group or a group is referenced and it creates a picture inside of our heads that we've created, that's been created, it's been groomed in us through the media, through our family, through education, uh, et cetera, okay? And these beliefs, and these beliefs are usually about outgroups, meaning a group you're not part of can be positive or negative and doesn't really matter uh, you know, like, even if you hold a positive stereotype about a group, it could be negative, right? Like, so that's just kind of important. And, you know, the idea here is a lot of people think about this as generalizations about a group of people, right, that may or may not be truthful in some instances, right? But it's your belief about a different group of people, or it could be a group about a group of people um, an in-group too, you know, a group that you're a part of, um, that you, you know, like you kind of ascribe to the ascribed uh, stereotypes uh, given to that given to that group. So I think you know, if you can really think about it, um, you know, the media has an incredibly important role in perpetuating uh, stereotypes, like an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly incredible role in this perpetuation. And that does not exclude South Park. Um, and again, like I said, that has to do a lot with the maturity and the sort of, you know, um, tools that viewers have when they consume uh, episodes of South Park and how they, they make meaning out of it. But the media helps to cultivate stereotypes, right? It helps to, in, you know, give you ideas about groups of people. And it helps to perpetuate those ideas through repetition of those uh, portrayals. And I think that's really, really an, an incredibly important um, thing to think about is how the media cultivates and grooms us to think certain ways about certain groups, again, depending on who you are. Okay. Um, 
The other way you can think about stereotypes and how they, they in the media plays a role in this too is this idea of what's called like contact hypothesis, which is basically uh, groups that you have limited or no contact with, you will form your stereotypes on that group, whether they're positive or negative, based upon A, the limited contact you have with an outside group. Let's say you have very positive um, you know, contact with a few Scientologists and you one time in your life. Therefore, you maybe think all Scientologists are great um, people. Uh, or maybe you've never ever met a Scientologist and you've only watched, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, the actor who was, well, the actor who was a Scientologist, that's like all of them. Um, uh, the actress who, who was a Scientologist who did the show kind of exposing them, you know, and you've only watched that, what's her, oh, what's her damn name? Um, see, if you were in class, I'd ask you and, and someone would fucking know. Right. Um, I'm just having a brain fart. But, uh, you know, maybe you've only watched her show and and you've never come into contact with with uh, Scientologists. And you may think they are an evil cult based upon watching 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 that show. So what that means to say is you could have very limited contact with a group and that contact could be positive or negative and therefore you will you know you will ascribe those uh you know stereotypes or those beliefs onto that whole group of people based upon that limited experience or you may have no contact with that group whatsoever and therefore you will base your stereotypes or beliefs about that group on the media representations um, and reifications and et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, portrayals uh, and the discourse around that group um, based upon um, you know, media coverage or TV shows or video games or movies or, or whatever. It's because you've had limited contact or no contact with that group. So this is a little bit about how stereotypes work. I think the, the main difference though when we think about a prejudice versus a stereotype and I mean, there's various, you could really break this down. We could spend a whole class on this, but really think about the differences. Like a prejudice, there's, a, there's usually a negative feeling about the group, right? There's no positive, there's no positive um, feeling about the group. You hold a negative feeling. You're prejudging based upon it. So you've seen, you know, you've never came into contact with a Scientologist. You've only watched, you know, the documentary that shows them as a cult. And therefore, you, you believe that they're all part of a cult and they're all, you know, um, extorting money and violent and whatever, you know, whatever you've gotten from, from that show. So it's a negative feeling. You prejudge, oh, you know, I'm going to this party this weekend and like three of the people who are going to be there are Scientologists, you know, and oh, uh, you know, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with them or I'm going to treat them in this way based upon, you know, the stereotypes that you have and then you're prejudging them. So prejudgment prejudice is usually built off of uh, off of stereotypes um, not usually the other way around the stereotypes help to build the negative prejudice uh, I want you to watch this clip uh, of the Museum of Tolerance again uh, it kind of gets into uh, a lot of these uh, bits and pieces that we've been talking about um, and uh, it's actually a really great uh, episode talking about tolerance uh, and acceptance basically um, you know Mr. Garrison tries to be so gay that he will get fired so he can sue the school and doesn't have to work um, you know and um, you know everything he does he ends up basically you know getting applause at the end I mean he gets, ends up winning awards for being courageous and stuff like this and they get into the the concept of the difference between acceptance and tolerance and the idea of tolerance is like you, you know, um, you know, you tolerate the rain. You know, um, you tolerate, you know, things that you don't like, which means that, you know, um, you don't accept them, right? Accepting means you embrace them. You embrace the, the difference. You embrace the rain. You, you know, you embrace certain, certain people versus just kind of dealing with them. And that's what the episode gets into. So I want you to watch this uh, Museum of Tolerance clip. It's probably going to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. 
uh, because it uses a lot of, um, you know, racial slurs, uh, ethnic slurs, uh, you know, sex and gender slurs, um, etc. So y you may feel less uncomfortable watching it at home uh, alone uh, than you would with a group of 40 other people. It's very interesting, very, very interesting to watch this clip with a group of people where you have this large group who are often very, you know, very diverse, at least by University of Oregon standards, um, uh, where, you know, maybe things that you would laugh at at home or if you would laugh at around a group of people who all share the same, you know, identity as you uh, would laugh or feel or feel angry in that, in, in that sense. Like maybe you'd feel more compelled if you're in a group of people and they laugh for you to laugh to not feel like an outsider, although you may feel offended. So let's just watch this clip. Um, we'll get through it and then we'll come back. We'll set up uh, child abduction is not funny and then uh, we'll, we'll get into that episode. 